So far, we have covered three main studies on the cross. First, we looked at how the cross of Christ exposed Satan as the murder of our Savior. And then number two, we looked at the cross as the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And then finally, the third study, which is, was the most important, is how the cross demonstrated the self-emptying agape love of God. Now we have to turn our attention to the resurrection. So this study will deal with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at its significance, first to the Jews, then the disciples, and then to our salvation in Christ. To the Jews, the resurrection of Christ was the greatest and final evidence that God gave them that Christ was the Messiah. You see, we remember in our last study, in John 2, 16 to 22, Christ comes to the temple, and he is very angry because they had turned it turn the temple into a marketplace. He makes a whip, drives them away, and says, how dare you make my father's house a den of thieves or a, a marketplace? Well, they came up to him because he claimed the temple to be his father's house. So they asked him, what sign are you going to give us that you can claim the temple to be your father's house? To them, that was blasphemy. So Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He was not referring to the building. He was referring to his body. That is why, as we saw in our last study, that is why the Jews who rejected Christ demanded his crucifixion. Because to the Jews, crucifixion was hanging on a tree, which was synonymous with the curse of God. In other words, they had him crucified because they wanted God to curse him so that he would never rise again from the dead. That is what he predicted. So the resurrection of Christ was the greatest evidence that God gave the Jewish nation that Christ was the Messiah. When the centurion who witnessed the resurrection came to Caiaphas, the high priest, and said to him, He is risen. Caiaphas had only two choices, either to admit that he had led his nation to crucify the Messiah. And if he had done that in repentance, God would have done many wonderful things to the Jewish nation. But he chose the second choice, and that is to bribe the soldiers, to bribe the pilot, and tell the people that Christ was, his body was stolen. And to this day, there are some Jews who believe that. So once Christ rose from the dead, there was no excuse for the Jews to reject him. That is why when God gave the Jews another three and a half years of chances to accept Christ as their Messiah, when they stoned Stephen, that was the final outward evidence that they had rejected as a nation, not as individuals, but as a nation, that Christ was the Messiah. So that's number one. To the Jews, the resurrection of Christ was the greatest and final evidence that God gave them that Christ was the Messiah. What about the disciples? Now, even though Christ has predicted his resurrection more than once, they were, the disciples could not fathom this. So when Christ died on the cross, to them it was a great disappointment. You remember when Jesus came and met with his two disciples on their way to Emmaus? Remember what he said? What are you all talking about? And they said, Have you? Are you a stranger here? Don't you know what happened? We thought he was the Messiah, but now he's dead. It's four days now. And Jesus gave a wonderful Bible study. I wish they could record it. Beginning with Moses. He said, Oh, you slow of heart. Don't you realize that this had to happen, that I had to die? This is the only way I could save the human race, and I had to be resurrected. It was only as they approached Emmaus that he raised his hand to bless the food that they saw the nail prints and they realized he was the Messiah. And that is found in Luke 24, 13 to 34. And uh, you know what happened? Christ disappeared and the dis these two disciples, they didn't touch their supper. They got up and they read 
seven miles back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples what had happened. So the, dis the great disappointment was turned to great joy and hope. But what about us living in the 21st century? What is the significance of Christ's resurrection to the believers of, through all the ages? Well, number one, the resurrection of Christ, and this is something we need to realize, does not add to his righteousness which justifies believers. By his life and by his death, Christ fully redeemed the human race. So what part does the resurrection play? It vindicates his perfect righteousness. If Christ had failed, even in one point, do you know the Father would have no right to raise him up? So the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead is proof that his earthly mission was perfect and complete. Let's look at these two texts that bring this out. Romans chapter 1, the very beginning of this book. Listen to what the Apostle Paul pens here. In chapter 1, after introducing himself as the Apostle of Jesus Christ, he goes on to say in verse 2 that this gospel of God was promised before through the scriptures, to the prophets of the Holy Scriptures, that's the Old Testament. Verse 3, concerning the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So he took our humanity that belongs to us. And then in verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In other words, the resurrection of Christ vindicated his perfect righteousness which he obtained for us in his life and death. Then turn to verse 25 of chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, same book, verse 25. Talking about Christ, we read, who, that is Christ, was delivered up because of our offenses. That is why God spared not his own son. Christ became the sin bearer. And because he paid the full price, he was raised because of our justification. In other words, the resurrection proved that on the cross, our condemnation that we inherited from Adam, plus our personal sin, was now changed to justification. And that is, becomes ours by faith. So you have justification, which Christ obtained for all men, and justification by faith that applies only to believers. So that's number one. The resurrection of Christ did not add to his righteousness, but it did vindicate it. Now number two, the resurrection of Christ guarantees the resurrection of all believers at his second coming. And this, folks, is the blessed hope. This is what all Christians are looking for. Let's look at this. We'll start with 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, I've mentioned this before, but I would like to repeat it. There were some believers in Corinth, we could call them liberal believers, because they did not believe in the resurrection. And so in chapter 15, verse 14, Paul is saying to them, Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Verse 13, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. In other words, our resurrection, the foundation of our resurrection, the basis of our resurrection is Christ's resurrection. He is the source. We are the recipients. Verse 14, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. In other words, the, the hope of the Christian is not when you die. The hope of the Christian is the second coming of Christ when the dead in Christ will be resurrected. And verse 20 makes that clear. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Please notice, Christians don't die. They fall asleep until the second coming of Christ when Christ will raise them up to eternal life. And that is in verse 50 to 54. So let's look at what it says here. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood 
cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, sinful flesh cannot go to heaven, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Please notice, Paul's idea of a Christian death is not saying goodbye to life forever. It's a sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That is, we who are still alive. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on immortality and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Folks, this is the blessed hope of every Christian. It's a blessed hope. Now, 1 Peter also has something to say about this. 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and notice what Paul has to say in verse 3, 4, and 5. 1 Peter chapter 1. I read verse 3, 4, and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So when a Christian dies, that's not the end of him. That's why in Thessalonians, Paul tells us we should not grieve for our dead ones like those who have no hope. Because Christians go to sleep. So I read in verse 4 and 5 of 1 Peter 1. To an inheritance, we shall be raised, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So our faith is the guarantee of our resurrection in Christ. That is why, my dear people, the most valuable thing you possess in this world, it is not your stocks, it's not your houses, it's not your bank account, because all that will go one day. The most valuable thing you possess is your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't you ever give it up, because that is what will bring about the blessed hope. Now, number three, the resurrection of Christ makes it possible for believers to have a high priest in heaven as their mediator. Now we must keep in mind that while we are converted, while we stand justified by faith, while we have the Holy Spirit, we still have sinful natures. That won't change until the second coming of Christ. In other words, we are still sinners and therefore we cannot approach God directly. We have to go through our high priest. He is the mediator. So in, with this in mind, I'm going to read chapter 8 of Romans. Paul brings this out. Chapter 8 and verse 34. Romans chapter 8. And notice what Paul wrote in verse 34. Let me read also verse 33 so that you have something else to realize. Verse 33 is the question. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect, with the believers. One person will never condemn you because it is God who justifies and God doesn't speak from both sides of his mouth. If he has justified you as a Christian, he cannot condemn you. But now verse 34, who is he who condemns? Yes, we know the devil condemns us day and night. There are others may condemn you. But it is one, there's one person who will never condemn you as long as you accept are resting in his salvation, and that is Christ. It is Christ who died to remove that condemnation. But he hasn't stopped there. And furthermore, he is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Satan is accusing us day and night. Christ is by the right hand of the Father, vindicating us against his accusation. And by the way, in one of the studies you will study the investigative judgment of believers. And we will discover that Christ is not going to defend us 
but he's going to fully vindicate the righteousness that we have in him. Now, turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7, which says the same thing that we read in Romans. We have a Savior who's risen, who's at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. But Hebrews now, chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, using sanctuary language, I read these words. Chapter 7 of Hebrews, verse 24 and 25. Wonderful statement here. But he, that is Christ, because he continues forever. This is the contrast. The Levitical priest died and had to be replaced. But Christ is a high priest forever. That's why he's of the order of Melchizedek, which is brought out in verse 21. But he, because he continues forever. And that word is tamid, continue, which is the daily sacrifice of the sanctuary service that pointed to this. He has an unchangeable priesthood. So he will never be replaced by somebody else. Therefore, verse 25, he is able, he is also able to save to the uttermost, to the very end, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That is one of the privileges we have. So thank God for his resurrection. Without that, we would have no high priest. And then finally, 1 John chapter 2. And here I would like to remind you what we've covered in our second study in this series. But let me read the text first. Second chapter of 1 John and verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What John is saying here is that as Christians, we should not condone sin. Why? Because we have died to it, as we saw in Romans 6. John realizes that even though we don't condone sin, we still have a sinful nature that pulls us down, and we fail many times. Here's the good news. Does God reject us? Do we go back to condemnation? No, no. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And verse 2 adds, and he himself, that is Christ himself, is the propitiation, that is the covering of, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Here you have the two dimensions of salvation. Subjectively, Christ is interceding for us. He's our propitiation. He's our covering. Because that's what the word means in the Old Testament. He's also the propitiation for the whole world. But that doesn't apply to them until they accept him as their savior. Because that's a gift that has to be accepted. So that's number three. Now number four. The resurrection of Christ proved that God's power is greater than all the power of sinful flesh and of Satan. Now how do we come to that conclusion? Well, here it is. The accumulated sins of the entire world was put on Christ and he put him in the grave but could not keep him there. In other words, Jesus tasted the second death on the cross. Hebrews 2 verse 9. He experienced the agony of the second death. He experienced the agony of God abundant man. The hope of resurrection was taken away from him at the cross. And he surrendered to the curse of the law. Set us free. Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having been a curse for us. Now, when sin kills, it does not kill for three days. It keeps you in the grave forever. The wages of sin is goodbye to life forever. But you know, folks, the entire sins of the human race could not keep him down. Romans 8, verse 11. Listen to what Paul wrote here. Romans 8 and verse 11. But if the spirit of him, of Christ, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that is you who have experienced the new birth, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 
And then verse 13 and 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. In other words, if you let your sinful nature to control you, eventually the devil will pull you out of Christ and it will end up with death. That's in verse 13. But, the second half of verse 13, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In other words, when you become a Christian, Satan has lo lost one citizen from his kingdom. He will not take it sitting down, folks. He will do his very best to pull you out of Christ. He has many methods. Persecution is one of them. Either physically or socially or mentally. Or he will dangle the trinkets of the world, materialism. Because Paul told Timothy, the, lust, the love of money is the root of all evil, which some covet and by that destroy their faith. But the most successful method Satan has had to destroy the faith of believers is by perverting the gospel. By coming to you using human agents and telling you that you cannot be saved only by what Christ did. You cannot be saved only by grace through faith. You have to do something towards your salvation. And he was successful in doing that with the church in Galatia. And he's successful today in the lives of many Christians. You have to contribute towards your salvation. You have to keep the law. You have to do good works and all kinds of things. Yes, Paul upholds good works. He upholds the law as a standard of Christian living. But that is the fruits of salvation, folks. It doesn't contribute towards your salvation. But the resurrection proved that the power of the Holy Spirit, which raised Jesus from the dead, is greater than all the sins of the world put together. Let me illustrate this. When we were in the mission field, there were sometimes we were out in the sticks, and my kids, I have two children, they had no one to play with. So we invented a game. I think I did it. I laid on the ground with my hands at the back, and my daughter was supposed to hold my hands down, and my son was to hold my legs down, and their job was to keep me down. And then I would say, are you ready? They would put all, they would exert all their strength, and I would say, one, two, three, and I would push my daughter, push my son, and I would stand up. Proving that I was stronger than the two of them combined. Well, many years ago, later on, many years later, it was years ago, uh, while my son and daughter were in college in Walla Walla, which is in the state of Washington, one day my son came up to me and said to me, remember the game that we used to play? <laughs> Can we play it again? Now, he had just won the triathlon, uh, you know, triathlon in Walla Walla, and my daughter for three years was the champion of basketball. And I knew if, if I allowed them to put me down, they would keep me down for a long, long time. So I gave them a Bible text. You know, the Bible is wonderful. I said to them, remember what God's, the Bible says, the Word of God says. When you were a child, you played with childish games. When you grow up, you must put them aside. <laughs> so I escaped from that That unhappy situation because I don't know how long they would have kept me down. So please remember that the power of the Spirit is greater than the power of the sinful flesh. Now I want to give you another statement in Romans 8 that brings this out. Look at Romans 8 verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus have you got it? Has made me free, past historical tense, so this is an objective truth, has made me free or made us free from the law of sin and death. Please notice the word law appears twice. The law of the spirit and the law of sin. And the word law here is a constant force. Now here are two constant forces that met in Christ. The law of the spirit and the law of sin, of the flesh. Now, obviously the force that is stronger would win all the time. And what Paul is saying, that the law of the Spirit was stronger than the law of the flesh, so that even though Satan tried to use the flesh of Christ to give in to self, many times, turn stone into bread, come down and save yourself. The Spirit gave him power. 
to say no. So that through the power of the Spirit, Christ overcame the flesh. And he explained that in verse 3, for what the law, the Ten Commandments, could not do, even the Torah could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God's law cannot produce righteousness in sinful flesh. Who did? God did. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now some people don't like the word likeness. They say he looked like us. But you know the same word in the same dative case is used by Paul in Philippians 2, verse 6 and 7. Where he says Paul, Christ was made in the likeness of men. Did he look like a man or was he really a man, flesh and blood? So please remember, the word likeness is because Christ was not only human, he was also God. The divinity of Christ belonged to him. It was his by native right. The humanity of Christ was what he assumed. It belonged to us. But he assumed it because he could qualify to be our savior, our redeemer. That is what this is all about. So please remember that those of us who have experienced the new birth, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we have a power that is greater than the total force of our sinful flesh. All we have to do is to learn to walk in the Spirit. And that's Galatians 5.16. But I want to make it clear, folks. It is much easier to walk in the Spirit when you're under persecution. Like we were, my family and I were, in Uganda under Idi Amin and in Ethiopia under communism. It is much harder to walk in the spirit in the land of milk and money. That's the African definition of America. It requires more discipline. But we need to learn to walk in the spirit. Because we can't conquer the flesh. The spirit can. The evidence is Jesus Christ. His perfect life and above all, his resurrection. Now let's go on. This proves that the resurrection of Christ plays a vital part in the resurrection of all, redemption of all Christians. So we must not downplay the resurrection. Therefore, this gives us believers good reason to rejoice in the resurrection of Christ. Why? Because his resurrection is guaranteeing our resurrection as long as we are faith remains faithful to the end, as long as we endure unto the end. So no matter, no matter how hard your life is, no matter how difficult Satan has made your life, no matter what is your situation today, it may be you have lost your job or you have lost your houses because things are pretty tough these days for many people. Please remember that you have a hope beyond the grave. You have a hope beyond this world. There is no human solution to our problem. But there is a solution that Christ has made available through his resurrection. So let us rejoice in this wonderful truth, is my prayer in Jesus' name.